Thank you very much, Dr. Parstat. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, first, a uh, brief word about uh, the genre of these things. Um, my job as theology cycle director representing the theology department, this year's sponsor of the Stafford Lectures, is to offend against the humility of our lecturer by speaking exuberantly about his accomplishments. <laughs> And so also to introduce him to you. Uh, Father Geertik will no doubt be relieved to know that I've chosen a different approach, uh, one which will, I think, be more in keeping with the character of the faithful friar who is with us today and which will also give us, I think, a better measure of the man. The best way to understand this year's Stafford Lecturer, I think, is to focus upon that office in the church which he has assumed so generously since December 1st, 2005, when he was named Master of the Pontifical Household by now Emeritus Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. As holder of that office, which is often colloquially referred to as the Pope's theologian, Father Geertik is the heir and steward of a rich patrimony of which we too are heirs by virtue of our faith. The first holder of this office, Magister Sacri Palazzi, Master of the Sacred Palace, was none other than Saint Dominic himself. Theologians had been called upon to advise the popes prior to Dominic, but in the year in which he was named Magister, the stature of Dominic seemed to require that a special designation of office be added to that theological advisory function. The year was 1218, only two years after the official founding of the Order of Preachers, the eighth centenary of which we are observing in this year, 2016. So Father Geertik, as the current master of the Sacred Palace, is heir of a nearly 800-year-old office in the church, older by more than three centuries than the Roman Inquisition, now the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or the Index of Forbidden Books, now entirely defunct, all the holders of this position since St. Dominic have been eminent friar scholars of the order of preachers, indicating the confidence that the popes have had in the erudition and orthodoxy of the members of that order. In addition to his important work reviewing and advising the pope on the theological texts which flow into and out of the papal household, Father is also by office and or appointment a member of the Pontifical Committee for International Eucharistic Congresses, consultor to the aforementioned Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, as well as the International Theological Commission, and now also to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. As regards his personal preparation for the office, he now holds a bit of biography. Father was born in England in 1951 to parents of a very accomplished Polish family and graduated from the Jesuit Secondary School St. Ignatius College before returning to Poland for university studies in Poznan. Father just indicated it was a Marxist university, so a very interesting experience. Perhaps we'll get a chance to hear more about that. Um, Father entered the Dominican novitiate in 1975 and did his seminary studies in Krakow in what Father described as one of the oldest Dominican houses in Europe and was ordained to the priesthood in 1981. Afterwards, Father attended the Pontifical University of St. Thomas, the Angelicum, and took a license in spiritual, spiritual theology, and then a doctorate in moral theology in 1989, with a dissertation entitled, The New Law as a Rule for Acts. Father Geertik held various positions with the General Council of the Dominicans at Santa Sabina in Rome, and began teaching at his alma mater, the Angelicum, in 1994. 
Father still teaches regularly there and has authored a number of books, unfortunately for most of us, in Polish. <laughs> but I note that two of them bear the Latin titles Fides et Axio and Fides et Passio, which he described briefly to me yesterday. In addition to Polish and English, Father speaks French, Italian, Spanish, German, and Russian. <laughs> we can reduce the list later, Father, if necessary. <laughs> Needless to say, he is a man of linguistic culture, intellectual culture, and as I've come to find out with the help of a YouTube video even of musical culture. <laughs> The historical depth, 800 years worth, and cultural breadth of the milieu that Father Giertich inhabits is such that I am tempted to say that he comes to us not just from a different land, but from a different world. A world that more and more seems to survive only in our church. So from that rich world of which he is both an heir and steward, a world which is of course not just a past world, but a perennial world for those who enjoy the inheritance of faith. Father Wojciech Giertich comes to address us in two talks today having to do with the truth about man, which I will leave him to introduce to you. So now, Father Rectors, Dean Barstadt, faculty colleagues, seminarians, and honored guests, as I invite him to the podium for our Stafford Lectures, please join me in welcoming a true servant of Christ and steward of the mysteries of God, the most reverend master of the sacred palace, Father Wojciech Giertich. After this wonderful introduction, I have to first of all say that I am grateful for having been invited here. It's a great pleasure to be here amongst you. But I have to just say a few words of correction of what we heard. <laughs> the office that I hold for centuries was known as the Master of the Sacred Palace, but Paul VI changed the title, so I am the theologian of the papal household. That's a slight change in the, in the terminology. I am not a member of the International Theological Commission, uh, and I don't read German, I don't speak German, which I think has saved my theology. <laughs> My Russian is very weak, but I have read one book in Russian, and I read it in the Apostolic Palace, and that was Dr. Uh, Boris Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago. I saw the film first, and I, with the help of a dictionary, I managed to read it in Russian, because Russian is close to Polish, and I've often been to Russia, but it's not a language that I've studied. Spanish also is weak, but nevertheless, I manage in the other languages, including the foreign language for me, which is English, because I started speaking English at the age of five, whereas Polish is my mother tongue. But this is just to correct what was said at the beginning. My two conferences today will be about anthropology, the nature and vocation of the human being. The first will be theological, and the second philosophical. So the title of my first conference is The Human Vocation, Being Icons of the Icon. As I address this issue, I try, of course, to be aware of questions that are coming from the world, but certainly in this first conference, I shall not begin with them. Since I intend to view man with theological eyes, I have to do so as if with the eyes of God. Theology is based upon revelation looking into the truths that God has shared with us. This highest possible standpoint is illuminating, while at the same time it seems to be at odds with descriptions of the phenomenon of man presented by the empirical sciences. Nevertheless, I shall try to present a theological vision of man, believing that it is possible and indeed necessary to draw practical conclusions from dogmatic truths. So I begin with the Paschal Mystery. On the way to Emmaus, Jesus made the stark statement, You foolish men, 
Maybe it's a good phrase to begin a conference. <laughs> you foolish man. Huh? And then Jesus explained the basic principle of theological hermeneutics. Everything, the Old Testament and all human hopes and aspirations are to be interpreted in the light of the Paschal mystery. And that mystery is an act of the entire Blessed Trinity. Was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? The eternal project of the Heavenly Father became manifest in the Paschal Lamb. And that Lamb, without spot or stain, namely Christ, known since before the world was made, has been revealed only in our time, the end of ages, for our sake. In Jesus' death and resurrection, we see the supreme gift of self of the Son of God, who took upon himself our sin and conquered it. This sacrificial gesture showed the love of the Father. That is why, viewing the quality of the love in Jesus' heart and his solidarity with us, the Father was well pleased. God's love that precedes creation appeared in the spotless Lamb who had been scheduled as a gift for us even before sin had entered the world. The liberation from sin required a powerful act of charity and this was the motive for the freely accepted slaying of the Lamb who even though slain continues to live forever. From his open heart we received the divine love and power that is the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the supreme epiphany of God, greater than creation, greater than the revelation given to Moses in the burning bush, greater than what the Magi saw, and that is why it is normative. Only when the Paschal mystery is clearly in focus, the reading of the scriptures is accompanied by burning hearts. If we lack faith in Christ, then all Christian teaching, even the text of the Gospel, is frustrating. Revelation, as Vatican II recalled, is not to be reduced to an intellectual content addressed uniquely to our minds. Above all, it is the living Word of God that became incarnate, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to the Father and to us on the cross winning the powers of evil as he rose from the dead. Faith infused in our souls at baptism is a supernatural tool that allows us to adhere to Christ because it triggers the life of grace and adapts our minds to receive the first truth, a teaching that is not self-evident. Only by holding on in faith to Christ can we approach the divine mystery that illuminates everything else, including our own existence. If we ignore or shelve the Paschal mystery, failing to perceive its hermeneutic value, we will not understand anything. Thus we will deserve to be called foolish and most unfortunate. Those who have received faith at baptism and then they have locked the gift within themselves, treating it like an unnecessary, forgotten and unused computer program, merit the same description. St. Paul called the Galatians foolish, because they did not draw out in faith the liberating truth from the cross of Jesus. Divine Adoption What does this, all this mean for us? St. Paul saw that in the person of Christ there is a wealth of divine wisdom. I have been entrusted with this special grace, not only of proclaiming to the pagans the infinite treasure of Christ, but also of explaining how the mystery is to be dispensed. For all the ages this has been hidden in God, the creator of everything. Why? so that the sovereignties and power should learn only now, through the Church, how comprehensive God's wisdom really is, exactly according to the plan which he had had from all eternity in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has had an eternal plan for humanity, and the mystery of this plan was revealed in the total gift of self of Jesus. And it is the task of the Church, 
and her ministers to proclaim that eternal plan, confronting, if necessary, the powers of the world. The divine project of the Father for man preceded creation, and therefore also sin, and it reaches out towards eschatology. Before the world was made, God chose us in Christ to be holy and spotless, and to live through love in his presence, determining that we should become his adopted sons through Jesus Christ. In the original Greek, this is a long sentence with no punctuation, but apparently the focus of the entire text is on our filial adoption. A reflection on anthropology, if it is to be theological, has therefore to begin not with our status of creatures, trying to understand philosophically human nature, nor is it to begin pessimistically with original sin, reflecting upon how its consequences can be repaired. It needs to begin with the paternal project that aims at our living out our lives as adopted children and brothers and sisters of Jesus. This initial project expresses the yearning need of the heart of the Father. This means that human nature and also the conclusions of the natural law are all wrapped up within the divine plan. Thus the natural law is located within a wider perspective that begins with the eternal project of God, finds its ultimate expression in the new law of the gospel, the law that is the functioning of the Holy Spirit within human hearts, and leads to eschatological fulfillment in the plenitude of God. God is first a father and then a creator. And we are called to a filial existence, responding in trust to the pangs of the Father's heart. This is not reserved for afterlife, nor is it a reward for good behavior. It begins here on earth, even as we are marked by sin. First the Holy Spirit moves us, leading our faith to the Son, and then through him we discover the heart of the Eternal Father. An attentive response to the suggestions of the Holy Spirit expresses the filial relationship. Everyone moved by the Spirit is a son of God, Romans 8.14. As we react to the invitations of the Holy Spirit, such as to accept a vocation, to persevere faithfully in it, to be generous, or to pardon evildoers, we live as children of the Father. Ultimately, what is essential in Christian living is not the following of an externally imposed and rigid program, but a personal response to God in faith and charity. Wanting to denigrate an understanding of morality centered upon external rules, St. Paul described it as circumcision, knowing the abhorrence the idea would elicit among adult Christians of pagan origin. And so he concluded, in Christ Jesus, whether you're circumcised or not makes no difference. What matters is faith that makes it power felt through love. Aquinas hooked onto this final clause, faith that makes its power felt through love, and saw in it a manifestation of the working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit generates not enthusiastic religious feelings, but childlike openness to God through faith and practical charity. We see examples of such a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in couples going through a marital crisis, who in spite of difficulties penetrate in faith the darkness of their spiritual night and count upon the graces of matrimony. When on the basis of that faith they, make gest they undertake gestures of reconciliation, they locate themselves in the heart of the Trinitarian life. Through fidelity to the inscrutable divine mystery that unfolds itself in their lives, they allow themselves to be moved by the Holy Spirit. We can apply to them the words of St. Paul. We know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. And the medieval glossa attributed to St. Augustine included in the all things etiam casus impeccatum, 
even sin. The memory of sin is not an obstacle to loving God. Within his humiliation, it's still possible to return to fill your trust in God by responding to the Holy Spirit. The little way of St. Therese of Lisieux shows how to be a child before God without fear of past sins and temptations and how to undertake small, seemingly insignificant gestures that express infused love. Those that love God in simple ways are the one God chose long ago and intended to become true images of his Son, so that his Son might be the eldest of many brothers. Everyday life of faith and charity expresses the summit of Christian anthropology, that is the divine adoption, planned for us by the Father from all eternity. Icons of the Icon the filial relationship makes of us images of our brother Jesus. He is the image of the unseen God and the firstborn of all creation. He is the radiant light of God's glory and the perfect copy of his nature. As we contemplate the glorified humanity of Jesus, we have access to God. The Catechism, quoting St. Maximus the Confessor, states that the human nature of God's Son, not by itself, but by its union with the Word, knew and showed forth in itself everything that pertains to God. Jesus' his humanity, his earthly life, his words and acts, including the passage through death and resurrection, are the locus for the manifestation of the divine person. This was not only temporary, done for pedagogical purposes, but is irreversible and definitive. The Son of God became man and does not cease to be one today. As he worked with human hands, fought with a human mind, acted with a human will, and with a human heart he loved, the divinity of God became visible in human form. In the glorified face of Christ, we perceive the divinity as best as it can be seen, and also we perceive the fullness of humanity. No other image of man could be better. Anthropology, therefore, has an ultimate reference point in Jesus, and all the human sciences gather empirical data about man. But psychology, psychiatry, medicine, pedagogy, sociology and ethics all need some ultimate understanding with which they can compare what they know. If psychology studies the sick or animals and then transposes its conclusions on people, methodologically it is at fault. Some objective criterion of the healthy person is needed. This can be searched for in philosophical anthropology that tries to understand man in his pristine nature. But where can such a man be found? It is Christology that supplies the supreme beam of light that for anthropology is illuminative. We understand human nature best when we contemplate the glorified human face of Jesus. Jesus, the incarnate God, is God's best icon, and we are called to be icons of that icon, through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the status of the new man, one that is more profound than all the proposals of historical ideologies that also dreamt or continue to dream of some new man. St. Paul teaches that we with our unveiled faces, reflecting like mirrors the brightness of the Lord, all grow brighter and brighter as we are turned into the image that we reflect. This is the work of the Lord, who is Spirit. 2 Corinthians The divine image is elicited on our faces, not by external cosmetics, tattoos, pagan masks, or repressive psychic deformations, but by the power of the Holy Spirit working within the soul. The Christian doesn't have to imitate Hollywood beauty. 
He doesn't have to pretend or hide his inner self, as in Far Eastern religions. Nor is he to lock himself up in some psychic coat of arms, being regimented in a community that instead of formation proposes formatting, according to just one model. In Christ, the human face becomes a sign of personhood, of unique individual dignity, and also honesty in intention and action. It is enough that we respond to the inner suggestions of the Holy Spirit, and in time our faces acquire a supernatural humanity. Those who have spiritual eyes can discern a divine radiance in the charitable but wrinkled face of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Internal fidelity to the movements of the Holy Spirit generates a fascinating charm, an imprint of graceful grace on the human face. And then the church grows from within, from person to person, as the divine image becomes visible and attractive in the faces and gestures of individuals. This is a program for the church. A French Dominican, Father Marie-Joseph Le Guillou, wrote a book in the aftermath of Vatican II, explaining what had been the basic message of the Council. He entitled it, Le Visage du Ressuscité, The Face of the Risen One. And his main argument is that Vatican II initiated a renewal of the Church that aims at such an internal conversion that the face of Christ will become visible in the life of the Church. And so the serving pilgrim Church is to humbly approach wounded humanity in gestures of love. The Council tried to free the Church from a triumphalist and defensive position that had searched for social and political security. Instead of condemning, it hoped that the truth itself will be attractive. The Council reached out towards the Jews, the Muslims and non-believers. It defended religious liberty. It initiated Catholic ecumenism. It affirmed the dignity of the laity who are endowed with baptismal graces that lead to sanctity and make of them images of Christ. It showed that the Church is present in the world, above all through the conscience of individuals, who moved by grace respond with charity. Vatican II invited the people of God to hide within Christ so that he may shine through them. The ecclesiology of Vatican II springs from Christology as Christ expresses the self-communication of the Father. As the mystery of God is manifest in Christ, so also the sense of human existence is explained, because all are called to be united under one head, recapitulated in the body of Christ, that is the Church. A moral theology that elicits the icon. Can we somehow explain all this? St. Thomas Aquinas tried to do so in his major work. The Summa of Theology is a reflection on God. And since there are three modes of being of God, the work is divided into three parts. First of all, God as the Creator is everywhere, by way of immensity, upholding reality in existence. Second, God in a different way is in the souls of the saints. And third, God, again in a different way, is in Christ, through the hypostatic union and in the sacraments. Since God is everywhere, God is present in the wood or metal from which a tabernacle is made. In a different way, God is present in the soul of the individual who is praying in front of the tabernacle. And finally, in a yet different way, God is present in the Blessed Sacrament that inhabits the Tabernacle. Thus the Prima Pars of the Summa studies God in himself and in creation. And the anthropology that we find there tries to depict man as he came out of the creative hands of God. The Secunda Pars also studies God as he is present in the person transformed by grace. 
the moral theology of Aquinas, therefore, is in fact a theological anthropology, a description of the fecundity of grace working within the Christian. Moral theology is a theology, so it is about God. More about what God does to us than about what we do to God. And so when sin is mentioned in it, it is brought into the picture only so as to show the various ways how we can poison grace within us. But the prime message that we have for man is the possibility of his transformation by the power of God. And the Tertia Pars presents Christ and the sacraments. In the opening lines of the Secunda Pars, that present the key for the understanding of his moral theology, Aquinas brings in a quotation taken from St. John Damascene. This is significant because this Eastern father was one of the great defenders of the icons. The Byzantine quarrel about icons concerned Christology, and not just aesthetics. Since the divinity of God became visible in Christ, the supreme icon, so too the Catholic argument claims, it is possible to paint an icon in such a way that something of the divinity transpires through the wood. An icon used for prayer is a sacramental that participates in the divine and human structure of the church. The rejection of the icons by the Byzantine emperors was tied with the heresy of monotelitism. The Catholic faith teaches that in Christ there are two wills, the divine and the human. The heretics claimed that the human will of Jesus disappeared under the pressure of the, his divine will. It is obvious why the Byzantine emperors supported this heresy as a sort of state ideology. If a human will has no place in Christ, meaning that his humanity is reduced to the role of a puppet on strings in the hands of the divinity, it follows that individual Christians, too, are not to develop their human wills and personal liberty. They must remain passive and obedient towards the powerful and intrusive state bureaucracy that is endowed with the sacred authority of the Byzantine Emperor. It was in the logic uh, of the exclusion of the dignity of an independent and free humanity that the veneration of icons was forbidden. If the divinity of Christ does not shine through his glorified humanity, even more so grace cannot shine through that icon that is the humanity of an individual Christian. He is therefore to remain in servile pacifism, accepting fatally whatever political power is dominant, at that time that of the Byzantine emperor, and shortly afterwards the power of the Muslim overlords. St. John Damascene lived outside the Byzantine Empire, and so he had more freedom of expression. He insisted that the image of God is visible in man through three characteristics. Through his intellect, through his capacity for free choice, the liberum arbitrium, and through his being per se potestativum, that is having within himself the source of his action. It is this observation of St. John Amasine, Damascene on the icon of God visible in, mature, in the mature Christian that Aquinas quoted in the prologue that opens the entire Secunda Pars of his Summa. This means that the mature individual who is using his intellectual powers, who has developed his interior liberty, and who is standing on his own feet in his personal gift of self in charity, is a resplendent icon of God. An authentic spiritual life with true generosity that images God can be perceived even in the poor, the sick, and the uneducated. But the individual who is passive, constantly afraid, neurotic, self-centered, incapable of generous responsibility, and having a deep sense of entitlement with no sense of service, doesn't reflect the image of God. Such individuals still have an innate human dignity derived from their created status, but they do not shine with the virtues. Aquinas tried to spell out in detail what does it mean to be a living icon of God. 
And he did this so as to show how the merciful grace of God can heal psychic and moral wounds, eliciting the likeness of God in human life and in the human face. That's the moral theology of Aquinas, which is his theological anthropology in practice, is centered on the virtues and not on sins or commandments. The virtues express the resourceful and permanent capacity for creative reaction to moral challenges. Seeing virtuous men, we are inclined to praise not them, but the Father who is in heaven. The virtues, therefore, are intrinsically active, simulating personal responsibility. They are infused in the soul by grace and supported by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts are permanent capacities that enable the catching of the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. And so the gifts are passive, but then they invite creative virtuous reactions. Aquinas' description of the virtues, one by one, offers only a general picture, explaining their location within the psyche and their grasping of appropriate values. Their practical functioning needs to take into account the circumstances that are always unique. The theological virtues have the prime role because they assure a contact with God. The moral virtues flow from them as they gear the reason and the will and focus the affectivity towards the true good. It is clear that for the epiphany of the icon of God within the human person, it is the virtues that are decisive and not the gifts. It's not the individual who has had wonderful inspirations who images God, nor even the one who occasionally does something good, but only the virtuous person who has the developed capacity to work consistently and creatively for the good. Virtuous individuals are always surprising and unpredictable because of the novelty of their generosity. And many people go through life without ever crossing the threshold of virtue. They may try to avoid sins, at least some of them. They may occasionally do good things, in particular when circumstances force them to do so. But if they lack that creative ingenuousness and sense of personal responsibility for themselves and for others that is the mark of a true virtuous life, they are not resplendent images of Christ. A vision of morals centered on individual acts that are judged in their moral qualification, as was the case in the old manuals of casuistry, or a vision centered on moral norms, the sense of which has to be rationally justified or merely passively accepted because they have been imposed by some sacred or human authority, fails to express the full theological richness of the acts in Christian. Also, a purely philosophical presentation of virtue ethics is insufficient. It's true that we do not have a special language to describe the supernatural. And so, by way of analogy, we use natural terms in theology. There is, however, a basic difference between the acquired and the infused virtues. A mere listing of a catalogue of natural virtues and their rational justification invariably generates a sense of moral obligation. The virtues are then understood to describe a moral value or a duty that for some reason is binding. Such a discourse on the virtues that are to be acquired through natural effort is always boring and elicits the shrugging of shoulders. Some level of moral propriety may be achieved by aesthetic effort, motivated by a natural sense of responsibility, by the fear of punishment, and maybe even by the example of others. The infused virtues, however, are different. They spring from a childlike creative joy in response to the loving heart of the Heavenly Father, and so they have a playful spark about them. The first virtues that are to be recognized and cultivated are the theological. They maintain a personal relationship between the adopted child and God. It is possible to have faith in God and love Him, even when the experience of sin seems to prevail in the memory and imagination. Trusting the Redeemer, we are bold enough to approach God in complete confidence through our faith in Him. Ephesians chapter 3. When God is loved for himself, then simple good acts are done spontaneously, uniquely for the good pleasure of God. 
The spiritual person is aware that charity flowing from the heart of God is inviting a response. And God is as if pleading for the minds, hands and hearts of his adopted children so that something of his goodness will manifest itself here and now. The intellectual reception of such a vision of Christian life requires a correction of the understanding of the human will. That will is not standing in rival position against the more powerful and imposing will of God. It is not autonomous and locked in an arbitrary indifference to the good. The human will is also created, and as such it is subject to divine influence. The first cause that is God is capable of functioning within the second cause that is human liberty in such a way that the dignity of the second cause, that is of the human will, is not vitiated. A human act springing from interior grace is fully a hundred percent divine and at the same time it is fully a hundred percent human. Only God can so act within the human will without destroying it. The more we are moved by God, the more we become free. And our personal liberty is focused on that which has true quality, uh, is liberated from external and ex internal inhibitions. Furthermore, the will always works together with the reason, and both faculties mutually influence one another. Thus, within the free choice, the liberum arbitrum, there is place for truth and creativity. The untangling of misunderstandings about the nature of the will and its functioning, which unfortunately have marked European culture, is only possible when the philosophical heritage of an English 14th century Franciscan, William of Ockham, is rejected. This is one of the great needs of uh, Catholic moral theology. An excessive attribution of the liberty of indifference to the will generates a moral vision in which the will of God, deemed to be completely arbitrary and imposing, becomes dominant. Incidentally here, I may share with you an observation that I made while living in Poland. The communist regime limited creative possibilities, and so people easily succumbed to fatalist pacifism. Karol Wojtyła noticed this general irresponsibility in society, and so he wrote his books, The Acting Person, which he wrote in the back benches of Vatican II as he was bored, but a heavy <laughs> philosophical work, and Love and Responsibility. And he wrote these books so as to help develop the moral maturity of those who were reduced to being mere clogs in the socialist machine. Huh? Liberty was understood in a nominalist sense as being only against the oppressor and not for something. And moral formation was tainted by Pelagianism and the Kantian primacy of moral obligation. As a consequence of these unfortunate trends, many thought that we have to be morally pure in our relationship with God, proving to him that we deserve to be well treated understanding obedience to God as it was imposed upon society, namely as a repression of initiatives engineered by fear, and simultaneously they lacked an adult responsibility in their own lives. In fact, we need the exact opposite. We need to learn how to be, be a child before God, not panicking about our sins, and trusting in the freely given grace and at the same time we need to be mature and responsible, that is virtuous in life. All this of course is now changing in Poland in a different social and political context, but underlying presuppositions rooted in a particular theological tradition change slowly. Consumerism and a socialist sense of entitlement and a reaction against the church that is interpreted as being excessively imposing are contributing to a new wave of secularism. But coming back to my theological reflection, I repeat that everything has to be viewed through the prism of the Paschal Mystery. Theological anthropology, and more precisely moral theology, have to center not on morality itself and on the dramas that life brings, but on grace that springs from the open heart of Christ. And whatever the moral issue in human aspiration, it can always be viewed in this light. 
St. John Paul II, in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor, on Catholic morality, he drew the chapter titles from scripture, and together they add up and form a dialogue. Teacher, what good must I do? Do not be confirmed to the world, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. It follows that the graces of the cross are at the heart of the theological message about human living. And the Pope was aware that the power of the cross may be made vacuous when it is ignored or screened by erroneous thinking. We preach therefore not morality, but the cross of Christ and its fruits. We preach to man who already has been redeemed and has access to grace. This greatly elevates the moral standards that we can propose. And the prime fruit of the cross is the love of God that has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Church needs to cherish the reception of this divine love, perseverance in it, and its living out in practice. This is a maternal function of the Church, the ensuring that the spiritual life is not ignored. The word that is preached in the Church is always secondary in respect to the sacramental life of grace. And the basic function of, sacred, of the sacred teaching, that is theology, is to generate, nourish, defend, and strengthen the spiritual life, which being supernatural has within itself its own source of growth. Sanctifying grace is very fragile. It can be easily dismissed and extinguished by mortal sin. But the seeds of grace given in the sacramental character are extremely resistant. A supposedly inexistent spiritual life may suddenly in propitious moments reappear in full blossom, and it may then heal existing wounds and structure the psychic and moral life. Being brothers and sisters of Jesus, the recognition of the maternal function of the Church brings us to another chapter in theological anthropology. The term anthropology refers to both men and women. We do not differentiate between a theological anthropology and a theological gynecology. <laughs> the, the, the divine project that aims at our being children of the Heavenly Father encompasses both sexes. Huh? We are called to be brothers and sisters of Jesus as we respond with virtues to the inner movement of the Holy Spirit. We can, however, probe the divine project, wondering how it refers specifically to men and to women. And so we can address the scriptures, trying to find an answer to this query. And in fact, there are several questions that we can raise here. The first two questions concern the finality of the sexual differentiation as it sprang from the creative project of God. At the end of the corridor in the place where I live, huh, there is a chapel, and on the ceiling of the chapel, there is a famous fresco where God is touching the finger, uh, Adam's finger, Michelangelo, in this Sistine Chapel. Huh, he painted the ceiling, huh, and he painted it in such a way uh, that he included Eve hidden under God's left arm. The right finger is touching Adam, but Eve is already there. And she is peering out towards Adam, as if wondering, what is it that God has created for her? In the Genesis story, God explains himself, informing us why he created Eve. God says it's not good for man that man should be alone. So Eve was created with a mission towards Adam. She is to overcome the solitude of the male. This mission is given precedence above the other finality that is her specific role in procreation. To justify her feminine existence, every woman therefore has to ponder on the nature of Adam's solitude that she is to overcome. What sort of solitude was it? After all, Adam was in a state of original justice. All his faculties, um, all his spiritual faculties, unblocked by sin, were geared towards God. Huh? Can a male be lonely when he has God? 
And yet God noticed his solitude. And in response to this difficulty, God came up with the last act of creation, as if he had reflected most and put all his love into this final moment. And he created Eve, in whom the image and likeness of God seems to be more resplendent and evident. Do you agree? Well, look around. <laughs> God from the start foresaw a mutual complementarity of the sexes in their existence and vocation and Eve was specially endowed so that she could help Adam recognize how God is close and help him perceive the inequality of divine love. When men think about God they often come up with impersonal philosophical definitions saying that God is the absolute, the prime mover, the ultimate end. Men find it easier to describe the distance of God than his proximity. It was St. John who gave us the best definition, saying that God is love. But he learned this after having observed for many years the heart of Mary. Women perceive with greater spontaneity the tenderness of God and they are more receptive to the movements of the Holy Spirit. They find it easier to give freely, like God. The feminine physiology is geared to give. When a woman is pregnant or breastfeeding, she speaks to her child, saying, Take this and eat of it. This is my body. This is my blood. There is a Eucharistic dimension in the feminine body and psyche that we men do not have. And a woman is most happy when she succeeds in convincing the man of her life that he doesn't have to fear God, even though he is a sinner. And when she, when she nurtures within him a free of pride, openness to divine gratuity, and when she perceives finally that he himself has learned how to give freely without thinking what he will receive in return. None of the women in the Gospels have said, we are following you, what shall we get in return? <laughs> this is a male reaction. Huh? <laughs> Sometimes a woman has to wait for many years before her man gives something freely, out of love. Whereas for her this comes almost automatically. Since for her the reception and transmission of divine love is easier, she has a greater responsibility in this. Helping the male overcome his spiritual solitude, she fulfills the mission that was given to her at the moment of creation. Why then did God create the male? This is a more difficult question. <laughs> Some women will say that the creation of Adam was the rough version. <laughs> Genesis tells us that when there was no man to till the soil, God created Adam and settled him in the garden to cultivate and take care of it. So work plays a fundamental role in male identity and mission. The Vulgate translated this as ut operaretur et custodiret illum. It suggests that in the initial plan of God, male work is to be creative and protective. It is to change not only the world, but also man himself. He is to be personally responsible for his work, and he matures when that work is an expression of love. Man works because he loves both the work that he is doing and the family that he is maintaining by his work. After the fall, however, the work of the male is presented as tedious, causing sweat on his brow, being almost a curse. The Vulgate now describes the word work with the word labor, which suggests a heavy labor. As a result of original sin, man has the tendency of treating work as a purely mechanical task, done without any inventiveness, and even as an escape, an escape from God and from his family, where he is not loved and where he does not love. When there is no spiritual life in the male, when he does not know or ignores the fascinating gift of divine love, he then has the tendency to lock himself up in his original solitude and in his tiresome work, which gives him no joy. The wound that Eve carries as a result of original sin is the pain of birthing and her yearning for her husband who lords over her. 
The transmission of life is painful for the woman, not only in the moment of delivery. Spiritual maternity, the assisting in the birth of the spiritual life in her children and her husband, is also painful. She often has to persevere in difficult faith, standing beneath the cross that is her own husband, waiting for divine life to be born in his soul. She is tempted to present herself to the male in such a way that he then uses and abuses her, with no concern for her dignity, true needs, and physical and spiritual richness. The original wound that urges her to succumb easily to male manipulation has not only an erotic dimension, it appears also in her social relationship with men, when she easily accepts a servile position. It is the task of all, both men and women of every generation, to overcome this consequence of original sin. The New Testament revelation follows up and expands upon what has been said in Genesis. First of all, it has to be noted that in the Gospels there is no such thing as the vocation of women. It is the men who are called by Jesus, and they come with their aspirations and their projects. And the apostles need time to free themselves from fear of the spiritual adventure and from their own ideas and hopes so that their minds and hearts will be adapted to the Paschal mystery. The women are not called. They come on their own, moved by love that they find in their hearts. If according to Genesis the woman was created with the mission to overcome the spiritual solitude of the male, then in the Gospels that mission is extended to the overcoming of the solitude of that male that is Jesus. In the Gospels the women follow Jesus spontaneously. They feed him, give him water to drink, pour ointment on his head, are present at the crucifixion, and they return to follow up the funeral rites. In the church it is the women who ensure that Jesus is not left alone in the tabernacle. They are concerned that the celebration of the liturgy will be beautiful and animated by faith. And they convince men in the church that power is not most important, not even sacramental power. What is essential is faith that is operative in love. After all, the church is more Marian than Petrine. Male love is presented in the Gospels for a special formula that is used twice in reference to Joseph and to John. Being released by the angel from the fear of his vocation, Joseph took his wife to his home. And John, having received Mary as his mother, makes a place for her in his home. In both cases the same verb is used, implying a reception of the woman by the male. I see three dimensions in this specifically male love of the woman. First of all, a man expresses his love for a woman in the economic sense. He builds or buys a house in which they can live, and which she will fill with her feminine charm and their fruitful procreative love. Then he expresses his love for her when he notices that which is most spiritual and most profound in her, and he allows that to change him. He notices her charitable generosity and takes it into himself. Seeing her capacity, joy and service in being a mother, he learns how to be a father in the spiritual sense. And finally, with his rational mind, knowledge and logic, he confirms and corrects the spiritual intuitions that she has, giving her the certitude that she needs. These three dimensions of male love have also a place in priestly celibacy. The priest loves that part of the ecclesia, the church, that has been commended to him. He is concerned about structures, the roof of the church that needs to be repaired, about fundraising, about the parish, the diocese, the bishop's conference, or concorda. Second, the priest who loves is capable of discerning true holiness amongst the faithful. Just as he genuflects in front of the Eucharist, so he mentally genuflects in front of the body of Christ, the sanctity that he perceives in the people of God, which touches him, and then he allows himself to be changed, converted by this example. 
And finally, with his theological competence, he ministers to the faithful, confirming them in the salvific truths that had been handed down to him from the times of the apostles, and which he has studied and tries to understand. And my final point, preaching the mystery. Theological anthropology is an elucidation of the initial project that through Christ and his supreme gift of self leads to the living out of lives as children of the Heavenly Father in response to inner movements of the Holy Spirit. This brings out in Christians a likeness to the face of Christ. The preaching of this mystery can only be within faith and this requires courage. Many people will instinctively say that the white overall of a scientist inspires greater intellectual respect than the bishop's mitre. In spite of this instinctive opposition, we need to persist in faith, assuring a dominant place of the revealed mystery within the intellectual life, within culture, personal decisions and affectivity, because this leads to the spiritual fecundity of grace. Fidelity in the confession of faith is challenging both for the preacher and the listener. We need to believe in the divine truths that we transmit and in the presence of the grace of the Holy Spirit in the depths of the souls of those to whom we preach and also in the capacity of faith to enliven that hidden grace. The mysteries of faith have to be explained so that they will take root in the soul. There are currents in Christian tradition that assert that this is impossible. It's impossible to understand them. The Orthodox insist upon an apophatic approach, claiming that we can only stand in wonder in the face of the divine mystery that is completely beyond the cognitive capacities of the mind. The Lutherans view human nature as being permanently corrupt and only covered externally by grace without ever being transformed by it. Catholic tradition, on the contrary, has confidence in the intrinsic goodness of nature and therefore also in the natural capacities of the mind, in spite of sin. The mind is not so weak that it cannot approach the truth, both the philosophical known by reason alone and the theological received from revelation, the contours of which can be grasped. After all, it is the Logos that was made flesh. The believer is entitled to think within faith, and the mind may arrive at, at a precise formulation of the revealed truths, working out a coherent theological view of man, his identity and ultimate destiny, ultimate finality. This view, grasped by speculative theology, can then constitute the basis of the catechesis of all Christians, children included. We cannot restrict our ministry to the organization of happenings that show how the Christian message is charming and moving. Huh? A world youth day. <laughs> People need to understand what they believe huh? so that they may have convictions within faith. Huh? When they know what is implied in what they believe about human existence and its transformation in grace, they can then direct their lives accordingly. Theological speculative reflection studies the intelligibility and not the rationality of revelation. The meaning and inter internal coherence of the revealed truths, the nexus of the mysteries and their correspondence with what is known by natural reason can be grasped by the mind. But theology doesn't prove the truthfulness of the divine mysteries. They are received in faith. St. Thomas the Apostle saw with his natural eyes the wounds of Christ, but he believed in his divine Saviour. Aliud vidit, aliud credit. And it's not the task of theology to check out the truths of faith according to criteria that are extraneous to faith. If what is to be accepted in the, in the Word of God is selected according to standards set by philosophy, archaeology, linguistics, ancient history, the comparative study of religion, psychology, sociology, politically correct ideologies, personal subjective experiences, or ideas about expedience and pastoral relevance. This is all a form of Gnosticism. The mind with its own achievements is then treated as more important than the divine mystery. This is the attitude of both brothers in the parable. 
the left-wing prodigal son and the right-wing older brother both had their own ideas that they imposed upon the father. And that is why in their foolishness they failed to recognize the mercy of his paternal heart. All ideologies imposed upon God destroy the filial relationship with the father. The achievements of the natural mind and of the sciences are to be respected but they are to be in a Chalcedonian relationship with the mysteries of faith. At Chalcedon, it was defined that the divine and human natures of Christ are unconfused, asynchitos. Similarly, the knowledge of the mysteries of faith and the results of natural cognition are to be distinct and unmixed. This is because what is known through personal experiences and the human sciences is known directly and with clarity, whereas the truths of faith are mysterious due to the transcendence of the object. The reception of the mystery within faith requires an attitude of adoration, a purity that is open to the movements of the Holy Spirit and free of any self-satisfaction with cognition itself, which would demote the importance of faith. Thus we cannot scan the mysteries of faith according to our own capacities and ideas, but on the contrary, we are to scan our own lives, projects and aspirations according to the Paschal mystery. This is what the disciples learned on the way to Emmaus, and this is what the prodigal and his older brother were to learn from their third brother. Sorry then the third brother is the one who's hidden within the parable. The third brother didn't impose anything upon the father. He didn't treat his equality with him as a right, but he emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave. It was about him that the prodigal brother dreamt as he fed the pigs. It was he who, as an extension of the eyes and the heart of the father, received the returning prodigal brother and washed his feet. It was he who prepared the solemn banquet that celebrated the mercy of the, father, of the father's heart and the return of his prodigal brother. It was he who fell in conflict with the older brother. It was he who entered willingly into his passion for a total gift of self that seemed so scandalous to the purely rational mind. This is the way of the church. We need to allow the icon of Christ to be formed within us by the Holy Spirit and in our preaching we need to witness to Christ and his mystery and not to ourselves. It is certainly encouraging to know that the apostles were simple and sinful men, humble in the face of the mystery that transcended them. There was no hypocrisy in their preaching because they were centered not upon themselves but upon Christ. They did not reduce their message to the level of their own sinfulness or to the natural possibilities of the people they were addressing because they held on faith to Christ, speaking to men and women who already had been redeemed by him. Amen.